Hi, so yes, my name is Farah Bostic. I run a company called The Difference Engine. We are an insight-driven product strategy company, which means we do a lot of research with users. And we also help our clients figure out how to do research themselves, how to integrate that into their product design and development process. That said, I am a refugee from advertising which is indeed a bloody business. And, um, and there are several reasons why I'm a refugee for advertising. And a lot of it actually has to do with the way that we handle data as an industry and the way that we handle dealing with what people tell us about brands and products and experiences as an industry. And you know, we, we tend to de sort of depend upon these large survey instruments as the things that are the most statistically significant, the most rigorous, and have the most sort of authority as information sources. Ask a planner. And an advertising strategist, um, and she will tell you that she loves herself a tracking study. Um, and that, on the other hand, focus groups are this sort of really weird, uh, my clicker's no longer right, uh, that focus groups are this weird relic from the past, that somehow, because of technology, we should no longer have to get close to people's meat sacks in order to understand how they interact with products and technology and brands. And so this is regarded as something sort of oddly anachronistic. Um, but the truth is, it's not the people's fault that focus groups suck. People are great. <laughs> you can talk to people in all kinds of interesting ways. And I keep hoping that my friend Jamin will not be too embarrassed every time I show this picture of him. Um, <laughs> but um, that you can have much more immersive, obs observational, playful experiences, learning from people how they use products, how they interact with brands. Um, but the chief complaint that I hear is this. It's the Dr. House theory of, folk, of qualitative research. People lie. And that's true, more or less. But there are two reasons that I found that people lie to me, because actually they have very little incentive to lie to me. Um, the first reason is that we ask them to. <laughs> we create survey instruments and discussion guides and methodologies so that we will purposefully learn nothing new, be challenged in no meaningful way, and validate all of the things that we think about how brands work, how businesses work, Work, how people work. And so as a result, often when people are lying to us, they're actually showing us how we're lying to ourselves. And I learned this uh, firsthand several times over the course of 15 years of doing market research. But this has been my chief complaint, and that's that market research isn't nearly as sciencey as it pretends to be. Uh, less this and more this is the way that we approach research. It's much more panic than probability. And as a result, we tend to get these kind of strange feedback loops around brands and purchase behavior. I, I came across this experience myself firsthand when I actually did my own recruiting, uh, probably the second time in my career, um, a big changing moment that happens when you go off and start your own business. You have to do everything yourself. And so we started off working with a company called Silverado that provide uh, a variety of services for people with dementia and, and Alzheimer's. And we started out with the belief, the CMO and I, that other people's families were, of course, more functional than our own, and that when it's time to make a decision about committing a loved one into care, you would have a partner in that. There would be somebody else to help you make that costly and life-changing decision. After about a day of calling people who had been family members who'd made this decision with Silverado, we discovered that indeed we were not alone. In fact, that we were all alone together is probably the better way to think about it. And that people do make this decision by themselves for a variety of reasons. Geography, estrangement, money, stress, um, all kinds of things lead to this outcome. And as a result, after a day and a half of calling people, I was able to call my CMO and say, we were wrong because our experience is the norm. And so we need to change the methodology and learn from that so that we can actually learn how people make decisions in this space. That sort of thing does not happen nearly enough. We use a lot of processes in market research as gateways to learning so that the learning is scrubbed clean and is sort of stable, as opposed to actually learning anything that might challenge us. And um, you know, I think the, the thing is that in order to actually get to a place where, as market researchers, we can make better predictions and measure outcomes more effectively, we actually do have to understand the underlying systems, the underlying social uh, sort of motivators, the way that people actually behave and feel about things. And it's difficult to do that if we jump straight to pushing a survey. So the market research industry has sacrificed truth for science. 
Uh, this is not Beaker's fault, but it is, you know, sort of the situation today. And I think there's a lot to, to be said for sort of a lot of Nate Silver's argument in The Signal and the Noise, which is that we do need to understand the theory as well as the statistics. That statistical inferences are stronger when backed up by theory, or at least some deeper thinking about root causes. We do better statistical analysis and better quantitative research when we have better qualitative understanding. Um, the other story he tells, which I love, is sort of what happened after Moneyball. So after they roll credits on Aaron Sorkin's script, what actually happened next? And the truth is that this is not a tale of quant beating qual. This is a tale now of the Oakland A's spending more on scouts than they ever did before, because the scouts now have better data to assess qualitatively in the field than he's got a good face. And the quants are now getting better data from observation, instinct, insight, experience that the, that the scouts possess brought back into, uh, back into the, the quantitative analysis. So we talk a lot about measure what matters, but I think it's just as important if we're going to start building repositories of intimacy and empathy and understanding that, we just, that how we decide what to measure also matters. A really good place to start is simply be nice and listen. Thanks very much. <laughs>